Good morning, Christchurch. It's great to gather together this morning as a church and spend time worshipping our amazing God, bringing praise and thanksgiving to Him, and then hearing more of the Word. Uh, isn't it amazing to come together? Come on. Isn't it amazing to come together? Yes. Thank you, that's a bit more like it. Um, if you're a guest, you're incredibly welcome. If it's your first time or maybe you're coming a few times, um, obviously if you're not a guest, don't worry, you are also incredibly welcome. Even if you've been here 20 years, you are just as welcome. Um, but if you're a guest and you're not sure um, what's going to be happening, uh, my name's Owen, I'm hosting this morning, and we're going to start by spending a time of sung worship together. Uh, there'll also be time in that opportunity uh, opportunity in that time to bring words, if you have uh, prophetic words, pictures, God's given something, a Bible verse to share, or if you want to just come and pray a prayer of praise of how amazing God is, come and grab me at the front and we will uh, get that in the meeting, that's awesome. If you're a guest at the end, we're going to be doing, uh, we've got tea and coffee at the end, if you're not sure where to go, there is a guest zone, which is over there, and there'll be people who will look after you. Isn't God incredible? Isn't he wonderful? Um, I don't know about you, um, and a lot of you are going to groan at this, but um, because we have to organize quite far in advance in terms of church things, we start talking about Christmas quite early. And some of you may hate that, and some of you may love that. Um, but on the back of that, I've just been reading um, some of the sort of promises and foretelling um, of Jesus in the Old Testament, and they're just so amazing. I want to share one with you this morning as we go into worship. In Micah 5, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. I don't know what kind of a week you've had coming into this uh, Sunday morning. You might have had a really peaceful week. You might have had a really, really torrid time and you're really struggling. I just want to say that God's promises, which he foretold in Jesus coming, are true today and he will be your peace. He will be your strength. So let's spend some time worshipping and glorifying him this morning. We're going to spend time worshipping and then we're going to take communion together. So Maybe over the time of worship, just start to prepare your heart for that as well. The Bible says that we're meant to take communion seriously. So over this time, let's just start preparing our hearts before God, readying to take communion together. But let's worship our incredible King Jesus. Yeah. If you'd like to stand and let's worship together.
So I just felt God give us, me a word for the church, um, this church here. In Revelation 2, verse 3, when it's talking to the church in Ephesus, which was like the commercial center of Asia, he's, he's, Jesus says this, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and that you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you have at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. And as I read that, I just felt God give me a word for us as a church. Um, I just feel, I, I don't know you, but in my head, I always associate losing your love for Christ as being weary, that you've become weary. But this verse says they weren't weary, but they'd lost their love. And they still were doing loads of great stuff. 
And I just feel for some people here that have been believers for a really long time, you're patiently enduring, you're keeping going in the faith, you're not giving up, you're doing good works. But actually, if you're honest, you've lo lost that first love that you have for Jesus. And I've just felt, um, Sinai, I've both felt over the last six months, God just reignite a deep love for Jesus, what he's done for us. A love that whenever you think about it, you find that you're smiling and you're amazed that God would save us. Why would he save us? I've got no idea why he would save me, but he did. And I'd just love to pray for us that God would just be doing this revival in our hearts. You know, if you want to see revival, it has to happen here first in our hearts. And we need to fall back in love with Jesus, a love that's so deep where you remember that actually, even if you've been a Christian since you were a little child, the Lord Jesus has rescued you from a broken life. When you sing songs like that, you're singing about what your life would have been like if Jesus hadn't stepped in and set you free when you were a little child, so you've grown up knowing and loving Jesus. So shall we pray together? Do you want to put your hands out in front of you? Youth, this is for you as well to respond to. This is relevant, actually, for quite a few of you. It's difficult being a believer as a young person, but actually you need to have that love of Jesus so deep in your hearts that it drives you forward. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just praise you and thank you that you came to earth, that you died for us. We thank you you didn't do it out of duty. You did it out of love because of your deep love for us. Lord Jesus, I pray for each one of us. Would you reignite that first love? May it never be said about us that we've lost that first love that we had for you, where we work hard and we endure and we're not tired, but actually we've forgotten the love that we had for you when we first realized what you've done for us. I pray for believers here who can't even remember what that felt like because they were children when they became believers. Remind them, Lord Jesus, of what their life would look like if you hadn't have stepped in and set them free. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be a church that are defined by our deep love for you and our love for each other. We just pray, Holy Spirit, would you just pour down upon us this morning? Would you be doing a deep transformation in our hearts? We pray for our young people, draw them into a deep personal relationship with you where their love for you drives them in their life to be so different from those around them. And we pray this in your name. Amen.
Amazing that we can say it is all through Christ and nothing about what we can do. Isn't that just, I don't know about you, but it makes my shoulders just fall down as I can go, it's not me, it's Christ. It is all because of what Jesus has done. Uh, I've got a couple of words that um, God's given us, and I just want to ask uh, Philip to come up, he's going to share what he's got God's put on his heart. Good morning. Wasn't last Sunday morning a fantastic sermon from Tom? I thoroughly enjoyed it. But before he started, I had this thought within my mind. If you look across a field of wheat that's growing, golden wheat, the rain doesn't just fall on one part of that field. The sun doesn't shine on just one part of that field. The rain falls upon the whole field. The sun shines upon the whole field. In other words, God does not show any favoritism. He treats everybody the same. And I was put to the test straight away after the service. But God in his glory and grace brought me through. I could have buckled up and gone, but I didn't because God is far greater than the trials we go through. So God has no favoritism within this church. We're all one. Support one another, encourage one another because the harvest is ready and it's gonna be, and the field is gonna be harvested one day and we're going home to heaven. So God, I assure you, has no favoritism within this church. Yeah, isn't that an amazing word? And if that's you this morning, if maybe you are here this morning, you're thinking, actually, you know what? This might be for other people, but God wouldn't really do that for me. God wouldn't really die for me. He doesn't really care for me. My life isn't like X, Y, or Z. Please hear that. Take it as an encouragement or as a challenge, if that's needed. We have an incredible God who is so worthy of our praise and adoration, and he cares so deeply for each one of us. So let's stand, if you're able, and let's continue praising our amazing God who shines and waters us all.
amazing. Kids, it's your time to go to your groups now. Um, Lord, we just pray. We pray over our children and young people. We thank you for them. We thank you that we are a family here at Christ Church, that we dwell together from the youngest to the oldest. Uh, Lord, you love each child dearly in this church. You love their energy. You love their passion. And Lord, I just pray they would fall ever deeper in love with you in their groups. Lord, thank you that we um, we don't do a babysitting service at Christ Church. Lord, this is church. This is church from the youngest to the oldest. Lord, as they go and they uh, worship, as they learn about you, Lord, I pray that their hearts will be ever captivated by you. I just want to ask uh, Nay to come up, uh, who's got a couple of words for people um, who are in need of healing this morning. Uh, if everyone could stay standing, we're, we're still um, going to be worshipping um, together. And if I just hand over to uh, Nay, she's going to just, yeah, share these words. And then we're going to sing together about how God binds the broken together. Uh, so the first is, um, I feel God was saying, there's someone with a problem in their left shoulder, particularly kind of around the back, around the shoulder blade. And the other with um, problem in their legs, particularly in the joints in their legs. Um, so if that is you, um, just yeah, either lay a hand on the or where it, where the, the pain is, or raise a hand and get someone around you to pray. Um, but I just want to pray, Father God, thank you that you are a good God who loves to heal. That it is your heart that we be made whole from the inside out. God, I pray that you. Um, just come and bring your healing by your spirit this morning that where there is pain where there's stiffness in joints um, where there is lack of mobility and strength god i pray that you completely restore joints and muscles and ligaments to how they should be by your spirit father god we ask that your kingdom come right now that we can testify to your goodness and your love for us that you are a God that is so close that you would even heal the smallest pain God I pray that you just completely restore even things that have been may have been troubling people for years and that recurring problems but that seem to never go quite away God I pray that this morning you would bring healing and miraculous power you will be glorified here through the works that you're doing in this church but God I pray in this moment bring healing and restore things as they should be any injuries any tension God release it and bring your spirit to work to show us your goodness and your love for us and your glory and your power that you are greater than any physical ailment you're greater than any spiritual battle you're greater than anything that this fallen world might put upon us. Father God, come and heal in your name.
Yes, Lord, thank you that we're here because you laid down your life. You laid down all so that you were broken and beaten so that we may live. You died that we may live and by your stripes we are healed. Lord, we thank you so much for that amazing work that you've done on the cross for us. We're now going to move into a time of communion. Um, If you don't know what communion is, communion is uh, the taking of the bread and the wine that Jesus commands us to do as a body together. Uh, The body uh, represented by the bread and Jesus' blood by the wine. So we're going to take communion together. Now, as I said earlier, communion is uh, not something we take lightly. It is an incredibly important and sacred act that we do as believers. And I just want to read a passage from 1 Corinthians 11. And then if you'd like to go and take bread and wine, bring it back. Don't take it. Uh, We're going to take it as a body together, as a family together. Paul writes, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So as we go to take the bread and the wine and bring them back to our chairs, Let's just be reflecting on our own lives. Are there things that we need to lay down? Are there things in our hearts that are not pleasing to God that we need to lay down? Is there maybe disunity? Have you, are you holding a grudge against someone? Do you need to go and do reconciliation before that? This is a time for that. Just so you know, if you uh, need gluten-free, um, I'm told that this one to my left and that one to the back right um, are the gluten-free options. So if you'd like to just go and grab communion together, take them back to your seat, and then we're going to spend some time together. everyone's got a chance to have got bread and wine let's read together and take together 
for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all take the bread together. Lord Jesus, we think of your body that was broken for us. The body that was whipped, a crown of thorns thrust upon your head, then was made to carry your cross through the streets and then hung up on that cross. Lord, what agony. Also that we could be whole in you. Lord, we thank you. Amen. And in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the wine together. Lord, it is your blood that washes us purer than snow. It is your blood, the blood of the lamb, sprinkled in sacrifice, that means that all our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven, and we are found righteous in your sight. And Lord, because of that, in this new covenant, we can live free as sons and daughters. Amen. Amen. We're just going to sing the first verse of that song again, and then we're going to complete the story by singing When He Comes in Glory.
thank you, Lord. Thank you, O oh my Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to take your seats, thank you so much, worship team. Uh, if you missed my welcome at the start, uh, my name's Owen and I'm hosting this morning. I've just got a few notices uh, to bring and then I'm going to hand over to Sai, who's going to be continuing our series in 1 Thessalonians, which I'm sure you're all really looking forward to. I know I am. Um, a few, yeah, no, a few notices before we begin. Firstly, um, as we say every week, we, we don't pass around the offering um, baskets anymore. Um, however, we have a number of ways that you can give to the church if you feel so led through bank transfer, um, through cash, uh, through contactless payment, uh, lots of different ways. If you're a visitor and this isn't our please give us money plug, um, this is something that we do as a family together, so please feel no obligation at all. This is part of our worship together. Tomorrow evening, we have Breakthrough Prayer, um, which is amazing, our monthly prayer meeting, which is at 7.30 here, so please put that in your diaries if it's not already there. Um, that would be amazing. And then on Saturday, next Saturday, we have our quiz night, which the young people are running, which, yep, yeah, exactly, which is going to be an amazing evening. Um, if you haven't booked tickets already, please do. It's going to be awesome. Uh, Wednesday, I think, is the final cutoff for tickets. Is that correct? I'm forgetting them into the office. That's what I've got here. I've got Wednesday. Yes, I've got a thumb up from Jenny. Wonderful. And it's maximum teams of eight, three pounds per ticket, uh, which is, of course, a steal, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, yes, it's going to be an amazing evening on Saturday. Uh, next Sunday, we have got our Remembrance Sunday service. So obviously, uh, 11th of the 11th is Remembrance Day. We have our service on Sunday, on the 13th, here at 10 a.m. Um, so please be inviting people. Um, it's great for us to come together and to remember uh, those who have laid down their lives um, for peace and still do to this day. I know with the current um, world climate, this is very, very um, important this year. So yes, Remembrance Day next Sunday next week. And finally, uh, I'd like to ask Erica up because she is going to be talking about Reflect Pregnancy Crisis Centre, which is being set up here at Christchurch. Erica. Oh, and Anna. Good morning. Um, you hopefully you'll have noticed this um, logo coming up um, a little bit recently, and we'd like to introduce um, Reflect to you. So um, Reflect is a ministry in pregnancy crisis care, looking to offer compassionate care um, to women who find themselves pregnant and don't know what to do. Um, also for women who find out that the baby they're carrying has an ab abnormality or there's um, another problem with the pregnancy and they also don't know what to do next. Also for those who may have had an abortion and can't move past it, and um, those who've lost a much wanted pregnancy or baby and need to work through it um, to find healing. And we're also offering this service to men who are affected by any of those situations too. Um, so our ethos, um, I think that's come up, yes. So at the heart of Reflex ethos is our Christian faith, which is outworked through compassion, care, respect, and being non-judgmental. Non Next one. So um, we, I just wanted to read out Isaiah 60, verses 1 to 3. So arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And um, we see Reflect as holding out light and hope in the darkness. We're not campaigning. We're not forcing our ideas on people. We are holding out light in the darkness. And as it says in Isaiah, people will come to the light. So I just wanted to give a few um, facts about abortion. Um, one in three women in the UK will have an abortion by the time they turn 45. Um, in February of this year, the temporary allowance for a medical abortion to be carried out in a woman's home, which is known as pills by post, um, was made permanent in law. And also in 2021, there were 
214,256 abortions for women resident in England and Wales, and this is the highest number um, since uh, records began. So, um, next slide. So this chart illustrates how abortion is being increasingly used in our society to manage unplanned pregnancy and even as a contraceptive. And um, the church can't close its eyes to this increasing problem in our society because it's having a detrimental effect on all aspects of health and well-being, including emotional, spiritual, physical and mental health in many men and women. Yeah, so as Christians, we believe what it says in Psalm 139, that God creates each person. Each person is unique and precious, that they're knitted together by Father God in their mother's womb. He has a plan and a purpose for each life, and that is why life is so precious and so sacred. We believe that God is the one who has the authority to give and to take life and that we as mere humans should not get in, intervene in either of those processes. Uh, we recognise as well that this is a view which is becoming increasingly disregarded by our society as I think that chart before shows so clearly. But Jesus said when he was here on the earth, I am the way, the truth and the life. You know, Reflect has been set up to offer a compassionate response to the increasing darkness of this situation that is happening here in the UK. We want to bring the light of Jesus into these broken situations and bring the hope and life-filled goodness of Jesus in a positive, compassionate, hope-filled and practical way. So I'll just, um, on the last slide, it just runs through what we will be um, doing which is um, we'll be offering uh, counselling to women who find themselves pregnant and they're not sure what to do. Um, if people's pregnancy, which was initially straightforward, has suddenly turned um, into a crisis through a change of circumstances, we'll be providing a safe place for women to talk through that situation. We also um, will be offering post-abortion counselling to women who have had an abortion um, in the past and just are not able to move past it. And um, I can say as someone who works in healthcare that often when you look at women's uh, medical history, that if you're looking for it, you find the link that many women who have had an abortion then subsequently seem to suffer severely with depression and anxiety. It is linked um, and also we are offering counselling to women who've had a miscarriage or they've had a stillbirth or multiple miscarriages. We are offering um, child loss counselling as well to those women. And the service is also available to men because we recognise often men are not involved in that decision and they might find out afterwards that things have happened. And that's really painful because if you haven't even known that you were a father and then you find out that you weren't involved in any decision process. That is something which we want to um, also help with. You know, we recognise that with the statistics of one in three women in the UK having had an abortion by the age of 45, that there will be women in this church who are directly affected by what we're talking about today. Also with miscarriage and stillbirth, there will be women here that even as we're talking about it, it's so painful for you. You know, we, we want to start our work by offering all of these services to women in the church. So if you know that actually as we're talking, this is such a painful issue for you, if you um, want some help with that, I'll just remind you that as believers, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. He is able to forgive. Even when you can't forgive yourself, the Lord Jesus has forgiven you. And we would love to stand beside you to help you to bring healing um, through this counselling so if you know that that's relevant for you, then please, please don't just leave and think, I can't tell anyone. There's no shame for you. We love what Jesus has done on the cross is that he has removed our shame. Shame says, I'm a bad person. Guilt says, I get things wrong. 
And if you're someone that you just feel, I'm just a bad person because I did this, we would love to walk through this counselling with you. So if you f feel that that's relevant for you, then there's Erica, myself, and Sophie, the lovely Sophie here. She's just doing her training now. We would love to just introduce ourselves to you and also to talk through how we can help you. But thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Anna and Erica. Um, I'm just going to ask Sai to come up now. He's going to continue our sermon series on 1 Thessalonians and share the word of God. Let's just pray for Sai. Yeah, Heavenly Father, thank you for this man. Thank you for uh, the love that he has for you. Thank you that you um, have spoken to him clearly through this. And Lord, thank you for the amazing wonder that we have in you. Lord, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, you would just speak through Sai right now. His word, your words would flow through him. Amen. 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 Thanks, Owen. It'd be good if uh, uh, Ken, do you just want to stand up a second? Ken's off to Uganda this week. Well, hopefully off to Uganda this week. Oh, and Sue, Sue. Oh, she's like, oh, you're not sitting together. Oh, they've had a row, clearly. So, uh, <laughs> no, 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 they haven't. Sorry, I thought, <laughs> there they are. Uh, yeah, so if we can uh, um, just pray for them quickly. So if you're near them, just put a hand out to, towards them. We're just going to pray that uh, God um, uh, blesses them, protects them, and goes with them. Lord Jesus, thank you for Ken and Sue. Thank you for your uh, hand uh, upon them, Lord Jesus. Lord, I just pray as they go that you keep them safe. I pray they'll be able to get there, Lord, with all the uh, flight cancellations and all those sorts of practicalities, Lord God, with uh, uh, the potential of uh, uh, deadly diseases um, there as well in Uganda, Lord, that they're trying to get under control. I just pray your hand will be upon Ken and Sue that you would bless them, that you would um, fill them with your spirit and you would use them to encourage the church out there and bring them back safe to us. And I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. They're uh, gone for th three weeks if you get there. Is that right? Yes. Three weeks. So do be praying for them. Also be praying for um, Andy and Rob and Duncan who are in Bulgaria. They, uh, they're there today. They come back t tomorrow. They're having a great time. So I hear from Tetsi and pictures from... Uh, Duncan as well, so uh, be uh, keeping them in your prayers as well. I don't know about you, but I love the fact that in this church we have loads of uh, children and loads of babies in, in particular. I love kids, as those of you who know me uh, know that uh, some people find that quite strange about me, but I love kids. I've got four myself, and you may not know but I helped deliver all four of them. I was like an assistant midwife because I asked to be uh, one in that situation. With Elizabeth, I did go a bit green and had to go by the window for a little bit and then say, no, come on, Si, pull yourself together. Be a man. Let's get back and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and help. But by the time Sam came along, our last born, I was a natural, apparently, according to the other uh, midwife because we actually we only had one in the, at that, that, that stage as well. But you know, the level of pain and the immensity of the pain that you ladies go through, it looks, looks terrible. But <laughs> I, I, I'm so glad us men don't have to do it. And uh, could you imagine the fuss that would uh, happen? But uh, I spoke to one consultant gynecologist uh, uh, after Josiah, and he, he said, do you know, I love my job. I was thinking, okay, well, why is that? He said, because every day I go home and I thank God that I'm a man. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there you go. Our, our, our Josiah was easy. There should be a picture. There he is, little Josiah up there. Oh, isn't he cute? Yeah, yeah, to embarrass him over there. But uh, he... Uh, he was most easily our most difficult delivery because he was back to back. So that means his spine was against Anna's spine and uh, uh, making a, a painful process that much more painful. And uh, after he was born, Anna did great, as you would, would imagine. She sort of uh, pushed through that and uh, out came Josiah. And as I handed little tiny Josiah to Anna for the first time, I'll never forget her words, in fact, because she, as soon as she took him, she said, I can't imagine this being my last baby. It's like, what? <laughs> did you see what you were just, well, you didn't see, but you felt what you went, went through. And, uh, you know, for the joy of new 
for earth. Women will go through the process of being pregnant and giving birth again. Hence, we have Sam. And the Bible says, For the joy that was set before Jesus, he endured the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Got a bit of that that, communion bread stuck in my throat. (laughs) The agony, the shame, the horror of the cross. Jesus endured that, knowing that through his sacrificial death, he would take many children to glory with him. The joy of new birth in Christ Jesus. On that cross, you see, the righteous judgment of God was poured out on Jesus against all the wickedness, all the sin, all the things that have been done, all the things that have been said, all the things that have been thought that are wrong were poured out on Jesus. And he bore that punishment for them on himself. The only person to live a perfect life was Jesus. And so he willingly, out of love, as we've heard this morning already, became that sacrifice, became that substitute for us to take our punishment so that all who put their faith in Jesus can be forgiven, they can be accepted, they can be adopted into God's family. They can call him Father, as we've been singing about this morning. And because God accepted that wonderful sacrifice on our behalf, and because death itself had no hold on Jesus because he was sinless, he rose again three days later, giving all of us who have put our hope in Jesus that glorious promise, that certain hope that we too will rise again to be with him for all eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the gospel, my friends. That's the truth on which we stand as Christians. That's the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And our passage today, as we continue in 1 Thessalonians, makes that clear. Paul does not want us to be uninformed, he tells us, about the certain hope that we have in Jesus. He encourages each one of us to stand firm under the fiery trials of this life that come our way. Those difficulties that we face each day due to sin, due to sickness, due to satanic attack on our life, due to other people's selfish choices that impact us. In Christ, we persevere for the joy of the eternal hope set before us. Amen? And also, because of the joy of fruitful service that God has assigned to each one of us. We have a part to play in extending his kingdom here on earth. It's a real privilege to be involved in that. Don't be like the football players. You know, you see them, they get so distracted with themselves, how they look. They're so distracted by what the crowd think of them that they end up missing the ball. Don't be a football player like that. Don't be a soldier who abandons his post to the enemy because he's looking for home comfort in a wartime. We're in a wartime as a church, my friends. In Christ, we have an eternal future that is going to be beyond amazing. So stand firm under the trials that God allows you to face day by day. Let's look at the passage, shall we? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18 says this. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others, as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead 
in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Hallelujah. What amazing words, eh? The hope that we have in Christ is, is beyond amazing. If you want to start just by looking at the verses 13 to 15, they should appear on the screen uh, behind me. We'll spend a bit of time in them before we look at the, the next bit. But the Apostle Paul, you see, doesn't want us to be uninformed as to what happens to Christians if they die before Christ returns. He uses the well-known euphemism of sleep to refer to death, which was actually was used in his day as well, but has that particular meaning for Christians because it, 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 it helps emphasize it's only a temporary thing. It's not a permanent thing because we have a glorious future hope. That's why he says we don't grieve as others do who have no hope. You see, Jesus is clear, isn't he? He says in John's gospel, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Amazing words Jesus uttered. And we as Christians, along with the Apostle Paul, can say as he declared in, um, in Corinthians, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Because the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. If you're in Christ, you have victory over death. Hallelujah. So whilst it is right for us to grieve the, the passing of loved ones. It's right for us to mourn. We're not called to be Stoics where we're unemotional. We suppress emotions. God is an emotional God. God gave you emotions. That's why you have them because he has them and you're made in his image. Jesus wept over the Lazarus, his friend, when even though he knew that a few moments later he was going to ri rise him from the dead, he was, going to, he was going to bring him back to life. But Jesus still wept. So we do cry, and we do grieve, and we do mourn, and we do miss people on those special birthdays and special occasions that they're not here, and they're not going to see them along with us. But it's not the grief of permanent despair, but like those in Paul's day had. That's what they, they thought. It was, it was permanent. But it's of temporary loss, knowing that for those who have fallen asleep in Christ Jesus, as the Bible says, it is better by far for them. Hallelujah. Now, don't confuse the word here, sleep, with them being, the people that are dead being unconscious as they're uh, in some sort of soul sleep. Uh, some Christians do hold that view kind of loosely based on Revelation 6, 11. But in the light of what Jesus teaches and the Apostle Paul teaches, I think John Stott sums it up when he says this. He says, certainly Jesus' own reference to what happens after death suggests a conscious awareness of bliss or pain. And Paul, in contrasting this world and the next, wrote, for him, life meant Christ and death meant gain. He would hardly regard death as gain, much less better by far, unless he believed it would bring him a closer, richer, fuller experience of Christ than he was already enjoying. William Hendrickson writes, this falling, asleep does not uh, th sorry, this falling asleep does not indicate an intermediate state of unconscious soul sleep. Though the soul is asleep to the world which it has left, it is awake with respect to the world it is now in. So whilst absent in the body, the believer's spirit is with the Lord in eternal bliss. But the fullness 
of the Christian hope, the fullness of the glory that awaits us is uh, for God's people is when Christ returns and renews the physical world and re- gives us a perfect physical body as well. For we, as our passage says, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, through Jesus, so shall we, basically, it goes on to say. 1 Corinthians 15 gives us a bit more detail on this. It says, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. See, our passage makes it clear uh, to us that the dead will return, the dead in Christ will return with Jesus when he comes back and they will receive their resurrection body first and then we will be caught up with them in the air and also receive ours. As Paul explains a bit further in 1 Corinthians 15, he goes, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed, for the perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Hallelujah. That's that's what awaits you if you're in Jesus Christ this morning, if you're a Christian. At that moment, God will renew the heavens and the earth. He will also judge the living and the dead, because the dead will be raised. All those outside of Christ will have to bear their own sin before God and be cast out of his presence, as the gospel makes clear. But those who have put their hope and their faith in Jesus, Jesus and surrendered to him as Lord, he has already borne your sins himself on the cross, on your behalf. So this is what will happen to those of you in Christ, in Revelation 21, says this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Listen to this. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Hallelujah. The best of this world, but with no sin, with no sickness, no selfishness, no suffering. With God right there in the center of it all. Pouring out his love, his joy, his peace, his kindness and goodness on you as well. No wonder the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 2 that God is going to be showing us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in in Christ Jesus. Every day in all eternity, God is going to be pouring out his blessing on you and on me. Not because we deserve it, but because Jesus has won it for us. My friends, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be beyond amazing, is what I'm trying to get across to you. This is the joy that is set before you in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. It's the certain hope that is secured for us, not by our deeds, but by what Jesus has done. That's why the Apostle Paul could, Apostle Paul, the Apostle John could write this in 1 John 5. And this is a testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. 
I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. He writes it so we may know that we have eternal life. Hallelujah, my friends. Hallelujah. So Christchurch, whenever trials come your way, as they will do, whatever difficulties come your way, as they do, whatever burdens God allows you to face during this life, as 2 Corinthians tells us, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction, remember how much trouble and suffering and persecution Paul himself went through beyond anything or any of us have endured. He says this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Hallelujah. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul writes in Romans 8, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons and and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. Remember in, in the... In the Bible, the church is referred to sometimes as the bride of Christ. Men, you have to accept that you're referred to as the bride of Christ sometimes. And ladies, elsewhere, you have to accept you're referred to as the, the you know, sons in the sense that you get all the same birthrights as uh, the sons did back then. My friends, whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, don't let temporary pain or difficulty, or sadness, or illness, and I'm not minimizing any of those things. They're, they're real, and we get, that's why we have a team, a pastoral team, that can come and help you and stand alongside you during those difficult times, why we encourage people to be in life groups to help walk through those dark times that we all face. But don't let them distract you from persevering in the work that Christ has for you here on earth. For the joy that is set before you, endure all that God allows to come your way. Amen? Endure it for Jesus' sake and Jesus' glory. Let's, uh, let's move on to look at verses 16 to 18, because I need to bring this to a close. The return of Christ. At that moment, that only the Father in heaven knows, Jesus says. The command will be given by an archangel and the heavenly trumpet will sound throughout the earth. It will be a supernatural event and Christ will return. He'll wrap up history. There'll be no delay. The time of repentance for humanity will be over. Those in Christ forever saved, those outside of Christ as I said earlier, cast out into that terrible place the Bible calls hell, where there is no good thing. And God's heart is that no one goes there. 2 Peter 3 tells us. It should appear on the screen behind me. God's heart is that no one goes there. He wants you to experience him as father, not as judge. But because he is good and because he is just, he has to punish wickedness where it is. And we, his church, are the primary agent in which God wants to draw people to himself. So we need to get on with the mission whilst we still have breath in our bodies. Amen? Do you remember, uh, I said 
when I came back from the sabbatical, I talked about the, uh, uh, seeing people saved. If the numbers of believers, just based upon you guys in this room, let's forget the fact that there's nearly 2 billion believers uh, around uh, the world, but just based upon those in this room, if we were to double every year, then in 25 years, there'd be more believers in the world than there are people, which of course is impossible. But basically, the Great Commission would be completed long before that, just based upon the people in this room. I say there's many more than that. My challenge to us as a church was, back in September, was by next September, each one of us would have had the joy of leading one person to Christ. So let's go for it, my friends. Let's be diligent about seeking God to use us to save one person. It's not about numbers, my friends. It's about the glory of Christ and rescuing people from the worst future imaginable to the most amazing future imaginable that Jesus has for them. Be praying. Be sharing your faith. Be giving your all to Jesus, for he gave his all for you. Amen? Amen. Let's be going for it, my friends. For those of you, just a little aside, uh, well, it does fit in, because I know I'll be qu quizzed about it afterwards, but anyway. For those of you who are wondering, where does the millennium fit into this? You need to understand, that if you take Revelations 20, 1 to 10, literally, which many do, you have to superimpose it onto passages like this in the New Testament, rather than using passages like this to help guide your understanding of the apocalyptic writing in Revelations. For more on that, there's a seri preaching series on Revelations, and Revelation 20 in particular. You can listen to my sermon on that from a few years back. Otherwise, my friends, don't worry about it, because either way, the important thing from the passage that we have looked at today is that God wants us to be encouraged by the eternal hope that we have in Christ Jesus. So that for the joy that is set before us, we stand firm under the fiery trials of this life, doing our utmost to help as many people as possible to come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour before Christ returns. Amen? Amen. Can I invite you to stand? Can I invite the, the, the worship team to return as well, please? God wants to do great things through your life. Don't disqualify. You might be thinking, oh, that's for somebody else. You don't know what I've done. If you've given your life to Christ Jesus, even if you've just come to him in the, uh, the last uh, few weeks, God has great things that he wants to use you and me to do for him. The reason why he hasn't returned is because he wants more people in glory with him. And he wants to use you to bring them to him. So I'm going to pray for all of us. First, actually, I'm just going to pray. If you're here this morning or you're watching online and you don't know Jesus and you're thinking, actually, I, I want to go to that great future that was uh, mentioned. I don't want to be cast out. I, I realize I need Jesus. I don't want to bear the things that I've done wrong myself. I, I want Jesus to pay the punishment for them so that I'm free to know God. Then just pray this prayer in your heart along with me. God knows what you're thinking. God knows everything about you. So just pray this prayer along with me as the, as the rain pours down. Father God, thank you that you love me enough to send your son to die on the cross for me. Please forgive me of all the things that I've done that offend you, that hurt other people, that hurt myself. Lord, help me through the power of your spirit live the rest of my life for you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that 
and you're watching online, please contact the office. We'd love to be in touch with you. If you're here in the room, please come and grab me. I have a track that I'd like to give you just to help explain a bit more, and I'd love to uh, chat with you and even pray with you as well uh, a bit more about that after the message. But for the rest of us, God has a purpose and a plan for each of us. He wants to use you. You have the most amazing future ahead of you. So let's give our all, regardless of what we're feeling like, let's give our all to serving Jesus. Let's just pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, that you, you could have wrapped up history whenever you wanted, Lord God. You could have said, I've had enough of this human race, a total waste of space. And we are in one sense, Lord God. But Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you love us so much that you came to die for us. And you haven't returned yet because you want to use each person in this room to bring others to come to know and love you. Each one of us has a part to play in your eternal plan and purpose. And so, Lord, I just pray for each person here, fill them afresh right now with your Holy Spirit. Just, uh, just place your hands out in front of you if you want to receive from the Spirit. He's here. Holy Spirit, just come and meet with each person in this room, I pray. Father, just fill each heart right now. Lord, thank you, Lord God, that you said to the disciples to uh, wait in Jerusalem until they receive power from on high, until the Spirit had been poured out on them. And Lord, we, we ask for a fresh outpouring of your Spirit, Lord God. As the rain has been pouring down, we want a fresh outpouring of your Spirit upon us, Lord God. We're weak, Lord God, but you are strong. We are easily distracted, Lord God, but you are focused, Lord. We are faithless at times, Lord God, but you are faithful, Lord God. And Lord, I just pray, come and meet with each person in this room, Lord God. May they be transformed by your love. May they be empowered by your love, and may they be motivated by your love to reach their friends, their families, their neighbors, their work colleagues, all that you place around them. Be upon them, Lord God, I pray. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going we're gonna to close with a song of worship. If you want prayer, there'll be some space over here for people to come and pray with you. If you want prayer for just help to, there's somebody that you know that you want to share your, your faith with, but you're struggling, you know you struggle to share your faith, please come forward over here. There'll be people to uh, pray with you. If there's somebody you just want someone to come and, you know, say, I, want, I really want someone to come and pray for this person with me by name, uh, then come and get prayer for that. If you want fresh filling with the Spirit or healing, again, come and get prayer for that. Over there, we've seen people healed in this place over the last few weeks. We, we uh, uh, nay, um, had that word earlier. Please come and get prayer for that. I actually also feel that if you're here and you have problems with your hearing, whether it's partial uh, hearing or even a complete loss, come and get prayer for that. We believe God wants to bring healing in that area this morning. So as we sing this song of worship to close, uh, just be, be, begin to make your way forward. And as things die down, people will come and pray for you there.
you want prayer, please come forward over here. Also, I should say, actually, if you're grieving and if you're struggling with the, the loss of a loved one, and you just want someone to come put their arm around you and pray with you, then again, please come and uh, receive prayer for that. But we're going to close the meeting there. There'll be tea and coffee ready in a minute. Have a, have a great week and be, be blessed. But if you want prayer, don't leave this place without having someone come and pray with you. Amen.